Hi everyone, welcome back. This is Professor Casey. Uh, today we're talking about Chapter 17 from David Emery Shai's America and Narrative History. And uh, this particular topic is getting into talking more a little bit about uh, the industrial aspects of what's going on during and after the Civil War, particularly in the North. Okay. Um, by this point in time, the country has still been pretty evenly divided in terms of what its economy is capable of doing. Uh, the north half of the country has been engrossed in most of the industry throughout the Civil War, and the south has still been uh, very deeply entrenched and continues to remain so, for the most part, in the agricultural sector. Okay? And so there's much more wealth that becomes accumulated in the north compared to the south. Um, it's a very different culture, a very different uh, social makeup. Uh, so all these things uh, combine together and you'll start to see such a, a, a wide um, uh, disparity in terms of how these two societies end up encountering one another. Again, the northern economy has done so much during the Civil War to actually um, foster the war effort, if nothing else, uh, to the fact that the, um, the ability to manufacture things actually outgrows and outpaces the need for it to be applied directly to combat. Okay. After the war actually ends, most of the stuff that has been um, manufactured, uh, everything from uh, weapons and artillery all the way to textiles, uniforms, and so forth, all of that has grown so much that it can now be applied to the private sector. Okay. Um, and this also uh, benefits and goes hand in hand with the fact that from the end of the Civil War all the way to the dawn of the 20th century, the U.S. population is growing exponentially. Okay? It actually triples. Um, and even though the South has gone through a period of uh, depression, of course, especially after the Civil War, agriculture actually ends up doubling after the war ends, and not in the cotton industry necessarily, but in other areas. Okay, we start to see industrial farming taking place in the Midwest in particular, most of which has been fostered by the industrial growth that takes place in the North. Okay, so the West and the Midwest are kind of sponsored by what's going on in the North. Okay. And manufacturing, as I said before, too, is absolutely out of this world in terms of what it was before and even during the war. It grows by six times what it was before the war. And the U.S. manages to actually succeed in surpassing Great Britain, that is, which has been its, uh, its main um, uh, adversary, I guess, in all this, right? It's a friendly adversary, I guess, at this point. But in the past, right, Great Britain has been the biggest... Um, name in everything in the world. It's had the strongest navy, it's had the, uh, the highest level of manufacturing, the, the most success, the most wealth, and so forth. And now the United States is suddenly starting to catch up. Okay? Uh, it's, it's starting to double uh, what Great Britain is capable of doing in terms of its economic success, which has been virtually unheard of uh, for probably the better part of about 500 years at this point. And so once we get to the year 1900, and again, this little time span here kind of covers some of that a little bit. Uh, there's overlap from this chapter and the last chapter and so forth, so we kind of end up skipping around a bit. But once we get to the dawn of the 20th century, a lot of the, the big business industries that start to um, come about during the Civil War continue to grow out of proportion after the war and make way for things like steel. Uh, cotton industry makes a little bit of a comeback, right? We start to see the introduction of robber barons during this period. Big business, corporation, and politics all combine together. And so now the United States is suddenly cornering the market for most of the big commodities that are going around. And with this, of course, uh, there's a trickle-down effect, right? This begins to affect society, not just in terms of, um, you know, what kind of products are available, but also how it ends up affecting uh, social class uh, and, and those types of things. For one thing, there is a, a, a large um, eruption of success in big cities up in the north and in the Midwest. So places like Pittsburgh, Chicago, Cleveland, all these cities start to grow uh, quite a bit and they start to actually become central hubs for certain um, uh, manufacturing uh, 
uh, areas, right? Pittsburgh is known for steel production. Chicago becomes a central meat packing area. So each one kind of develops its own little niche here. And also, this starts to affect brand new generations that have been born um, during and immediately after the Civil War, right? Society and time continues to march on, and so now that new generations are being born, they're being born into a world completely different from that of their parents and grandparents, right? Especially now that emancipation has occurred, this is a brand new world. So people start to leave these small towns, they start to leave the south, and they start to go to work as um, quote-unquote unskilled workers in these factories and the mines and mills and stuff, which are now not just centralized to the north, but are now scattered all over the country. And also women begin to have a presence in the workforce as well. Okay, This is not just limited to uh, young white males the way it used to be before the Civil War occurred. Now you start to see young black men enter the, the workforce. You start to see uh, other minorities. Uh, Chinese immigrants begin coming over. Several waves of immigration come over during this time. And not only men, but now women themselves are also working as well. And as I, I used the term unskilled before, I should clarify, unskilled workers are usually individuals who are not specifically trained in one particular discipline. Okay? These are people who tend to be manual laborers, people who are trained on the job perhaps to operate machinery or um, uh, something of that nature. Right? Maybe they are, uh, again, just engaged in some form of manual labor, building something, uh, construction, those types of things. Uh, and the pay is quite significantly less than for uh, a skilled worker. Okay? And a skilled worker is essentially the, the type of individual that uh, cornered the market in these particular areas before industrialization occurred. So a skilled worker would be someone who is trained perhaps from an early age to be uh, a furniture maker, a clock maker, um, a blacksmith, someone who has had lifetime training in this area. And unskilled workers are able to be trained in a short amount of time to do something that they consider most people capable of doing. Okay? And so unskilled workers tend to make up the, the larger amount, the larger number of workers during this time period, especially in the industrial sector. And now that we've got new technology that's coming out of manufacturing as well, right? The manufacturing begins to give way to manufacturing machinery that can potentially replace uh, human labor, uh, machinery that can help uh, expedite that, that can machinery that can make more machinery, and so forth. So, again, this this exponential idea can be applied to this as well, and we start to see so much of the. Um, the use of industrial equipment, steam power, electricity, uh, all this starts to come into common use by society during this period as well. And the other aspect of that too is with the introduction of all of this stuff comes uh, new questions concerning are there going to be new laws that need to be put into place so we can protect people and uh, are there going to be codes of ethics as well. Okay, Initially uh, there, there has been no precedent for this type of uh, this type of economy, this industrialized uh, economy. So once you have individuals who are factory owners, who are business owners, who are potentially working people to death, right, or who are putting people in harm's way uh, during their jobs, right? There's no law set in place from the get-go to protect these people. Okay, so this is when we start to see the advent. Um, of uh, uh, worker strikes, of organized labor, and that sort of thing. So we'll start to continue to look at all those things as we go along here. And as a direct extension of that aspect as well, particularly uh, organized labor and the, the, the several layers of social strata that we start to see emerge during this time period, class conflict becomes another big problem. Right? There becomes a, a large disparity in people between people who have a lot of money because they have cornered markets and in industry, or right, they're making money hand over fist, but then the people who work for them are being paid significantly less. They have a lot more, um, a lot less job security and a lot more um, uh, danger in what it is that they do. Okay, and so there's there's plenty of resentment in social, uh, again in these uh, 
social strata uh, in politics and so forth. This is when uh, Marxism starts to kind of uh, have its first rumblings in Europe. It doesn't quite make its way to the United States yet. Uh, but we do start to see the evolution of that, of the, the plight of the worker in face of someone uh, who has uh, perhaps more power than they deserve. As I said before, we also start to see the beginnings of um, industrialized farming as well in all this. Okay? Part of that has to do with the fact that the country itself is growing. Okay? We've already uh, made our way across the nation. We are now a transcontinental nation. Okay? By the time we get to the end of the Spanish-American War, we have essentially rounded out the United States, the, the continental United States, that is. So everything from California all the way up to New York is all now a part of the modern United States that we know of. Okay? Um, Hawaii, Alaska, any other U.S. territories haven't come into the equation yet. Okay? We will approach that, though, in this class as we go along. Um, and to connect this country, now that it's such a large country, right? everything has to grow along with the territory in order for us to sustain it, in order for us to maintain that, that level of uh, authority and the ability to, to just have it. Um, and part of that has to do with the fact that we now have forms of nationwide transportation, particularly the railroad. Okay? And we'll talk more about the railroad as we go along here. But that, combined with the technology that gives us a form of instantaneous communication, things like the telegraph and eventually the telephone, equals the ability for us to make uh, a national marketplace uh, and potentially make this type of thing available to everybody in the country, right? So um, the floor of living uh, is ideally supposed to rise during this time period, and people are supposed to essentially gain a better lifestyle, but it doesn't all happen in an equal basis. For one thing, uh, as I said before, too, now that we have this large influx of uh, immigrants during this time period, primarily because of the need for unskilled labor, okay, um, we start to see uh, more of a, uh, a cultural and an ethnic mix enter into American society, more so than it ever has. Okay? There, there have been instances of immigration, of course, going all the way back to um, the first European settlers coming to the, to the Americas, but now we're seeing it in such a concentrated uh, group and such a diverse group okay, that we start to see more uh, conflicts begin to emerge. Um, and the, the individuals who come over, there are certain uh, waves that actually occur throughout the 19th century, okay? two distinct waves, and we'll talk more about that in, in a future chapter. But um, the U.S. government actually begins to offer certain incentives to, uh, to magnetize immigrants to come to the United States. Right? Uh, once these big businesses that are making so much money for the country begin to climb into bed with politics, there is a, a mutual agreement and a mutual need to make more money, and that involves uh, having more unskilled workers come over and actually work in the factories and in the mines and the fil fields and so forth. And these workers are individuals who are very highly motivated for one reason or another, right? They want to come to the United States to potentially get away from uh, social or political turmoil in their own home countries, uh, to potentially make a little bit of money and then go back home and you know live a, a, a healthy, stable life. Uh, some of them come for religious purposes. Um, there's, there's all kinds of different reasons, okay? And again, we'll talk more about the, the specifics of immigration as we go along. Uh, but just to give you a little statistic here, again, from the end of the Civil War to the beginning of the 20th century, there's an estimated over 15 million Amer immigrants that come to America. Okay? This is the biggest, uh, again, concentrated influx that we've got. Okay? Um, and again, with that rise in the number of workers, um, the, the capitalists who are actually in charge of these factories, who are in charge of big business, uh, want to milk it for all it's worth, and um, the the individuals that we now call the robber barons, right? These individuals who, um, you know, build certain businesses uh, from scratch, who potentially come from nothing. Some of them do, some of them are privileged, and so forth. But um, some of them have uh, much harsher business dealings uh, than others do, right? Some of them are willing to sacrifice the comfort or even the lives of their own workers in order to make money. So we get this kind of disparity between calling them 
robber barons versus titans of industry or, um, or, or something along those lines. Were they innovative or were they really just ruthless, cold-hearted individuals? Okay, there's, there's a lot of debate over that. Um, and as also, right, we've also said that the, uh, the political aspect of this is the fact that they, even though they provide a lot in terms of, you know, um, injecting uh, health and wealth into the economy, it, it also creates a lot of uh, social disruption, okay? Uh, you know, by putting so many people into a, a, an unskilled working class situation, we're, it's essentially putting people into, pigeonholing them into an area where they might be in an endless cycle of debt, potentially for the rest of their lives, okay? Um, and also because once we see capitalist uh, robber barons and that sort of thing, climbing into bed with, uh, with politics, and particularly the Republican Party during this period, we start to see a lot of political corruption, and it leads really to uh, two or three decades in which politics uh, is, is so very heavily influenced by all this that the working class suffers immensely uh, at the hands of, of individuals who, uh, who own all the wealth. Okay, And so this is part of what uh, ends up leading us into uh, a lot of the, the political turmoil and conflicts in the beginning of the 20th century, the fears of communist takeovers and so forth. So uh, not to jump ahead too much, but that's just kind of, this is the, the root origin of some of that. Uh, and again, too, all these advances that we've had in technology, uh, the ability now for um, big business to lobby politicians, to gain more money, to gain more prestige, um, the ability to cut costs, and also the ability to potentially knock out competition, uh, again, causes some individuals to just make uh, outrageous amounts of money at the expense of others. Um, going back to the idea of corporate agriculture and, um, and industrial agriculture, we start to see this used more and more in the Midwest, and it's a, something that's controversial for the time period, and of course it still is even today, but uh, the idea of taking something where uh, initially when the country was founded, farmers were essentially doing this for subsistence. Right? They were growing certain crops to feed themselves and their families, and if they had surplus, they would take it to market, sell it, and maybe make a little bit of money on it. That's the way the agriculture used to work. Now what we're seeing is with all these advances in technology, with new machinery, equipment, steam power, electricity, there is the ability to um, sow and reap massive amounts of crops, whether it's uh, fruits and vegetables, whether it's grains, whether it's the um, uh, uh, livestock, breeding all of them and so forth, doing it on a massive scale in the way that a factory would make uh, a product of some kind. Okay? And there is no small farmer in all this who is trying to feed himself, right? There is only an individual who is doing all this solely to sell all of it at market and make money, okay? So there's not a, it's, it's a completely different version and probably to small farmers who still existed during this time period, extremely intimidating and potentially offensive because they're, it's taking their livelihood and turning it into something completely different and obviously very corruptible. And these farms are, are called bonanza farms. The term bonanza is just a, a, another term meaning a fortune of some kind, right? If you, if you can you know, sow and reap you know, tons and tons and tons of grain and sell uh, X number of tons a year, um, you're, you're making a lot of money off of it in, in a way that is essentially creating uh, outrageous competition for a small farmer and potentially putting them out of business, right? If, if not starving them out altogether. By 1870, even only five years after the Civil War and all the destruction caused by the death of the cotton industry, the United States becomes the largest agricultural producer anywhere in the world, okay? Specifically because no one else has tried this or no one else has succeeded to this extent um, by using technology and innovation and so forth to create all this. So even though it comes across seeming like a good idea, again, with all the individuals that it ends up affecting, it's still debatable as to whether or not it's really a good thing. 
Um, Chicago, of course, like I said before, is one of these cities that develops its own little niche during this time period, uh, and in particular as being uh, the biggest slaughterhouse and meatpacking center anywhere in the country, right? And it's actually nicknamed the heart of the country, the heart of the nation, rather, uh, because of its location uh, as being kind of the centralized city, and also because of uh, all the different um, avenues that it has going in and out of the city, connecting the north, connecting to the south, connecting to the far west, and so forth. Okay, So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the meatpacking industry and so forth in a little while as well. As far as technological innovations go, uh, again, this is one of the key features of industrialization and of the Industrial Revolution in general. Um, and it's something that doesn't necessarily have its origins during this period of the 19th century. It actually begins at the end of the 18th century uh, and goes all the way until into the 20th century. Um, but the combination of having machinery that saves time, saves the ability to have to hire workers to do it, uh, makes life a little bit easier, right? Uh, convenience, if nothing else. Plus the ability to mass produce things, right? To mass produce machinery, to mass produce uh, products and commodities of certain kinds. All of that adds up to a greater sense of productivity, right? In other words, uh, an economy is going to do better if it works like a quote unquote well oiled machine, right? You've probably heard this phrase before. Um, and these are known as economies of scale. Any economy that can achieve this and be self-sustaining and be able to produce things on a massive scale, are, this is called an economy of scale. To give you uh, an idea of just how much industry explodes uh, over the course of about 100 years, um, uh, during the 1790s there's only about 276 um, inventions that are patented by the U.S. Patent Office. Okay, it's a very, very small amount in comparison. By the time we get to the 1890s, though, um, there's uh, just under a quarter of a million that are uh, done just during the decade of the 1890s. Okay, once we get past that, with you know uh, all the advents with electricity, alternating current, all this kind of stuff, everything starts to just explode in terms of the numbers. Okay. And you start to see everything from farm equipment uh, to uh, refrigeration to uh, home devices, uh, working devices, typewriters, vacuum cleaners, everything that you can imagine. This is all stuff that wouldn't even been available to the super rich uh, before because they hadn't been invented. But now that they can be manufactured on such a grand scale, they can be sold for a smaller amount because it's, they're cheaper to make. And so now, as I said before, potentially the floor of living ends up rising for most people. One of the individuals, of course, that is at the, the center of all this when it comes to communication especially is Alexander Graham Bell. Okay? And Bell is responsible for inventing what he refers to initially as the speaking telegraph, but which we now know today as the telephone. Um, and Bell's entire reason for doing this is actually rather tragic because um, the story goes that he was actually out of town on business and had a uh, his wife was actually home uh, and was uh, by herself developed an illness and uh, actually succumbed to the illness died while he was out of town and he didn't get the notice that she was even sick until after she had already passed okay and so the, the impetus for him to invent an ability to have instantaneous communication is born out of, out of tragedy. Okay? But it's, a, it's something that has uh, obviously been a life-saving invention for, for many people ever since. By the time he actually manages to invent the speaking telegraph, uh, the very next year he establishes what is called the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. We still know it today as AT&T. By 1895, over 300,000 telephones are being used all across the United States. Okay? And telephone systems are obviously very, very different in the 1890s compared to what they are today. Um, you had a central operator that would have to connect one line to another in order for one person to speak to another person. Um, and potentially, if you are on the same telephone line uh, as other people, you can honestly listen into other conversations. Okay? Um, you would speak into a receptor, kind of like what you see him doing here in the background, while holding a little, um, a little bell-shaped instrument to your ear as the speaker. So you would hear someone speaking through the speaker, and then you yourself speak through the microphone for them to listen to. Obviously, all this is <laughs> combined into a single unit now with our smartphones and so forth. 
The other invention that's uh, um, put into play during this period is the typewriter. Of course, everything had to be written longhand before uh, we uh, eventually come up with the, the printing press uh, sometime uh, during the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, but now, rather than just having copies made of one particular thing, now individuals can actually you know, expeditiously type something out. Okay? And um, this also creates a little market niche uh, for women to enter into the workforce because it was believed during the time, uh, and you know, some scientists, pseudoscientists, take from this what you will, uh, look at women as having better um, uh, dexterity, better, uh, higher motor functions uh, when it comes to using their hands, uh, being having the ability to have attention to detail and so forth. This was the argument, at least at the time, for women to be able to enter the workforce and work as typists. Okay, and so this is kind of the the beginning of pigeonholing women into administrative assistant positions or secretarial positions, clerical positions, and so forth. All of it has its origins with the typewriter. Okay? And because women are willing to uh, work for lower wages, at least during this period, this is before women still, before they had any real um, rights to speak of, unfortunately, uh, it, again, worked toward that whole goal of industry to be able to um, manufacture things at a, at a cheaper price. And so, again, creates the beginning of the, the wage gaps that we still see in modern society. Uh, and just as a little side note here for some trivia, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer is actually the very first novel ever written using a typewriter. Mark Twain was the first one to ever use it. And domestic sewing machines also work in the same capacity as typewriters do, uh, also especially when it comes to uh, pigeonholing women into these traditional um, uh, quote-unquote domestic roles, okay? Um, sewing machines initially begin as uh, these large cabinet-sized units that are probably much more expensive. Um, my, my own grandmother actually had one in her house and it weighed, <laughs> weighed upwards of 500 pounds, big cabinet-sized thing, where women can actually work and use electricity and use steam power or use um, perpetual motion of some kind with a foot pedal to actually do sewing much more quickly. Okay? And obviously, the quicker you can sew something, the quicker you can manufacture textiles into, uh, into clothing, the quicker you can sell it, the cheaper you can sell it for, and so forth. But once you get a, a large number of individuals using these types of machines in a small setting, right, then you end up with what we now know as sweatshops. Okay? Um, and the term sweatshop comes from a, what you see here, this, this concept of working large numbers of people, many of them immigrants during this time period, many of them young, unmarried women immigrants primarily, putting them in these conditions where they are essentially locked into a room, obviously before air conditioning, uh, where they are sweating all the time. They're not allowed to leave because, again, this is before women in particular and workers in general had any real rights. Okay, Putting them in this situation, they're going to sweat profusely, and that's where you get the term sweatshops. The other individual that most people are familiar with as one of the most um, famous inventors of all time is Thomas Edison. Um, and his, uh, his origins as an inventor uh, actually come all the way from childhood. He's, there's stories going around about him um, you know, being uh, attracted to invention as a child, to experimentation, to trying to figure out how things work. And being born into this particular time period, you can see here he was born in 1847, He's born into a time period where industrialization is just beginning to ramp up more and more in the United States. So um, if, you, if you want to think of it in generational terms, um, the, the way that millennials are often p depicted as being more uh, technologically prone or computer driven and so forth, Thomas Edison was kind of the millennial of his generation. He was the individual who was um, so well accustomed to new forms of technology and industry from such a young age that he was much more um, comfortable in that setting, I guess. Uh, allegedly, he built his own telegraph system as a boy. This is around the same time that, um, uh, well, I, I guess it would have been around the time that Samuel Morse uh, invents the telegraph system, so uh, Edison somehow manages to replicate that from a young age. 
Um, he works as a salesman from the railroad from the age of 12, and he actually goes uh, through a, a really rough situation where he is actually rendered deaf, um, uh, and I, I believe it's only in one ear, it might have been in both, uh, from an accident where a train conductor hits him in the head uh, with something. Well, uh, I think it was completely by accident. He was um, uh, maybe carrying a mail bag or something along those lines, but he received a, a concussion of some kind that uh, ruptured one of his eardrums. Um, by 1869, though, Edison is now a young man. He ends up moving to New York, uh, drawn to the financial district, and actually ends up inventing uh, the stock market ticker. Right? We see the digital form of it today, which you know renders the numbers in real time in terms of stocks that are bought or sold. Right? But back then, it was a, a, a mechanical ticker where people could actually um, sit there and just alternate the numbers in real time by pressing a button rather than actually having to handwrite it and then have to scratch it out and write a brand new one every few seconds. By 1876 he moves to Menlo Park in New Jersey which becomes his main headquarters uh, for essentially the rest of his life. He's actually nicknamed the Wizard of Menlo Park uh, for his ability to invent things on a regular basis and he actually promises um, the local newspapers that he will invent something every 10 days and that's essentially exactly what he does. In 1877, he invents the first phonograph, which you see in the background here. Um, he invents the long-lasting electric light bulb. Okay, and this is what you see up here at the top right. Okay, um, Edison was not the only individual working on some of these projects. He's the first one to uh, complete it, get it, get them working, and patent them. Okay, so uh, he's he's accused several times throughout history, and and he is still a controversial individual for whether or not he stole ideas from other individuals, particularly Nikola Tesla, who we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and by the time he's only thirty years old, he's the most famous inventor in the nation. Okay, he's he's getting uh, all this um, you know intrigue from from the public, from politicians, and so forth. Uh, and all the things that he invents are still things that we we cannot live without today as a society, right? Everything from the storage battery, the stuff that we use now to to power, um, you know, phones, to power uh, any battery powered object for that matter, uh, the dictaphone, which is you know a recording device, a mimeograph copier, electric motors like what we use in cars with with certain currents, and even motion picture cameras and projectors. Right, there would be no film industry today were it not for. Edison. Uh, he actually begins his the, the first film industry, uh, Thomas Edison um, uh, film industry. I can't remember exactly what it's called. Um, and again, he, he becomes a, a worldwide celebrity for, for doing all this. Um, Rutherford B. Hayes is the first president to really recognize him. Congress recognizes him, and he gains a lot of accolades in his life. Um, incidentally, one of the uh, light bulbs that he invents is actually still burning. Um, for <laughs> has been burning since the 1870s uh, um, and and all that, or 1880s, I believe. Um, it's a single light bulb has never been changed, and if I'm not mistaken, has never been turned off. Um, so <laughs> the next time you have a light bulb that burns out, um, it <laughs> Edison didn't mean for it to happen that way, apparently. And of course, with other aspects of electricity here, we see um, ad advances that end up outpacing the need for gas lighting. Okay, this was something that was used uh, as a as a mass means of, uh, of of the lighting industry up until electricity was used. Um, but buildings and streets uh, had certain gas lines that would run into pipes into uh, a small lamp, and you would have to turn a crank like you would have to turn a, a propane tank onto a gas grill or gas fireplace today to release the gas into a little current and then you would um, light a match or just light a flame at the end of it and it would light on fire, it would burn uh, as, as a light. Okay? And now that we've got uh, electric light bulbs, all of those end up replacing it uh, in the 1880s. So buildings, uh, street lights and so forth. You don't have to have an individual walking around the city all the time uh, lighting lamps or extinguishing lamps. It used to be a job in and of itself and now that electricity comes about it's one of the instances where uh, an individual has lost a job as a direct result. And of course kerosene lamps are another thing too. Uh, some some individuals, my again my own grandparents had their had kerosene lamps around the house, right? A little, um, little uh, vase shaped 
piece of glass with a base in it uh, that had a rag that was dipped in kerosene and you would light the end on fire and the, the kerosene would keep it lit. Okay. And now of course you have a light bulb that you can put into a lamp, click a switch and on it comes. Uh, by 1882, uh, Edison Electric Illuminating Company starts supplying electricity to about 85 customers in New York City. And uh, within only a few years, um, light bulb companies that have been individualized all start to be combined. Um, Edison essentially gains so much reputation and money in all this that he is able to actually buy out the competition and creates Edison General Electric GE, which actually manufactures most of the light bulbs that you see today. And of course, this lighting system is uh, initially used by what's called direct current, okay? Sending electricity from one power source directly um, using one form of current from the power source directly to the light bulb or to whatever uh, needs to be powered, okay? Uh, a couple of individuals are responsible for uh, using what are called alternating current. One of them is George Westinghouse, and Westinghouse is another um, uh, a relatively famous um, uh, electronics company today. Westinghouse still makes television sets even today. You can find, I think, video cameras and so forth that are all made by Westinghouse. Westinghouse was the inventor of the air brake, which is something that is still used by um, uh, you know the the eighteen wheelers that you see on the highway today, uh, and he is one of the individuals responsible for developing an alternating current system, uh, AC. Right, as opposed to DC, right? If you're a fan of heavy metal, AC-DC, the band, is named after this. Alternating current, direct current, okay? Um, and alternating current is a very um, high-powered system, right? You, you have a system that is alternating current from two different power sources, and you have to have a transformer in between the two, right? If you've ever seen a telephone pole at the top, that big cylinder thing is called a transformer. It's taking that electrical current and uh, powering it down enough to where it's not going to overload and blow up something. Okay? Otherwise, the power is so great that it can't do that. But Westinghouse establishes his own electrical company in all this, and not too long thereafter, Edison's company switches over to alternating current. Okay? So uh, Westinghouse is one of the individuals responsible for that. Uh, I mentioned Nikola Tesla earlier, and Tesla has gotten kind of a cult following in recent decades, uh, much more notoriety uh, for being an individual that is um, almost to a creepy extent uh, because of how um, how innovative he was and how forward thinking. I mean, his imagination is uh, to the extent to where he has predicted things like the internet. He has predicted uh, sources of renewable energy, cell phone towers. Um, he, <laughs> at one point, he even claims to have invented a death ray. Right? All these things that seem to have their origins in science fiction, right? In the minds of people like H.G. Wells or Jules Verne, uh, a lot of them were actually uh, realized by Nikola Tesla. He actually came up with diagrams and so forth. Um, uh, unfortunately, in many instances. Um, he tried to sell them in some cases to the U.S. government, specifically forms of uh, renewable energy in particular, and the idea of having um, a, a tower that provided free electricity to everyone uh, and, and so forth. And the government rejected him because it wouldn't make any money, right? And so these patents are still floating around somewhere out there, <laughs> but, uh, um, but te Tesla is the one who actually invents the alternating current motor. He is the one who provides this to uh, to Westinghouse to produce electric motors, dynamos. Okay, this is how we have anything that's electrical, electrically powered, any kind of um, motor for anything from automobiles to elevators to whatever. Right? Tesla, we have to thank for it. And Tesla was a very quirky individual anyway. He is known for being an extreme germaphobe. Uh, he lived quite a bit in isolation. You actually see him here in the background. This is kind of hard to tell now, but um, he's uh, very famous for uh, creating these electrical arcing systems where you see in his laboratory here um, lightning that's literally being produced in the air um, by, these, uh, by these arcing systems. And he managed to find a way to ground the power enough to where it wouldn't electrocute anybody and he would put on these you know really uh, stupendous public shows where he would seem to harness lightning in the palm of his hand and throw it and all this kind of stuff so he's def definitely a showman uh, in all this um, 
it, he's actually lived a, a pretty tragic end to his life. His uh, his celebrity status didn't quite uh, keep up with uh, Edison throughout his life. And so once he got a little bit later in life, he got a little bit more uh, eccentric, a little bit more withdrawn from society uh, to the point where the he would only eat food made by one particular woman who was a servant of his. And when she died, he quite literally starved to death because he refused to eat anything made by anybody else. Um, he's also known for, for breeding pigeons and, and uh, using them in experiments and so forth. Um, uh, toward the end of his life, there's actually a very famous and quite sad image of him, the last image that you see uh, from the 1940s to where he's well into his 80s, and he's just essentially a skeleton with skin on. He's, he's just he's so shriveled up and withdrawn, um, but a massively uh, imaginative individual, uh, well worth looking into. And so now that electrical current and direct and alternating currents are being able to be used, factories can now be built anywhere, okay? And electrical equipment can be installed in any place. You don't have to use hydropower next to a dam or next to a river or a waterfall anymore. Um, you don't have to try to tap into geothermal power and use the heat of the earth or anything like that. Now these factories can be constructed anywhere. Which, of course, leads, as I said before, to the use of motors to power everything from elevators to the subway system, which starts in New York in the 1890s, um, and uh, trolley systems, which you see in places like San Francisco even today. Right? So all these uh, new innovations, again, they put people out of jobs in certain ways, but in other ways, too, they provide, provide much more convenience and, in some cases, even better sanitation and so forth. With the advent of the railroad, um, this is quite possibly the biggest innovation in the United States during this period um, because they don't just change the culture, they don't just change society, um, but they are able to link the country together by uh, an entire system that most other countries on the face of the earth were not able to do or didn't um, have a need for during that time. And so part of the reason why the United States becomes one of the bigger localized countries during this time period that is I, united as a single country. Um, of course, this becomes the, the fastest form of transportation that we have up until this point. Obviously, it's before automobiles or anything like that. Um, horse and buggy is really the only way to get around at this point, or by the use of horsepower. Um, if anyone has ever seen Back to the Future, of course, the, the third Back to the Future film, they talk about how you know you can get a, a train all the way up to 60 miles an hour. Of course, the goal is 88 in that particular time. And you know, by the standard of a, a modern automobile, right, most of them can get all the way up to 100 miles an hour or more today. Um, 50 miles an hour was was faster than a bolt of lightning back then. So this was much much faster than anybody could have expected. Um, and given the fact that um, getting on a horse and traveling from one city to the next was the fastest means of transportation. Uh, I mean, it takes it took several days to get from Boston to New York during you know the the 17 and 1800s, and nowadays, right, you might get there in a couple of hours by by conventional transportation. Um, the other thing that this creates, this is the first time that we actually begin to divide the country into time zones because people suddenly start to realize with things like the curvature of the earth and so forth, the massive uh, amount of land that is traversed by a train, that um, the sun rises and sets at a completely different time depending on where you are in the world and, and where you are in the country. So now our country is distinctly divided into several different time zones, eastern time zone, central time Time, mountain time, Pacific time, and those types of things. And the other reason why this is so important, especially when it comes to trains, is because um, train powered or trains during this period are powered by steam. Okay, and steam power provides the ability to have an accurate uh, assessment for delivery time. Uh, Any time that something like a ship, for instance, would have to travel from Europe to the United States, it was essentially at the mercy of the elements, right? Whatever wind is blowing, it could take a few weeks, it could take a few months, depending on what the weather is like. But once steam power comes in, you have a constant uh, amount of uh, steam pressure that is powering whatever vehicle you're in, and it's slow, it's steady, per it's perhaps slow, it is definitely steady, but it will get you there 
on a specific time, it dep depending on how much power is put into it. Okay, and so that's what uh, allows for for trains. And this is also when uh, pocket watches become popular for the first time because the train runs on a time schedule. Right, you know for sure that there is uh, a twelve o'clock train, for instance, coming in. Okay, and you can bet on your stopwatch that that's when it's going to come in. Um, the downside, of course, to the railroad is this is obviously massively expensive, right? This is taking all of the innovations that have been put into play in the United States and is compiling them all together and utilizing them in a way that's never been done before. And so the nation ends up going into quite a bit of debt uh, in, in building the Transcontinental Railroad uh, and, and hiring workers and so forth for it, uh, and not to mention all the accidents and everything that occur. And the railroad industry becomes the official, the first official big business that we have in the United States. Um, we, we start to see individuals who become so uh, 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 embedded in this that they're, they're the first ones who are making so much money, the first ones who have so many people working for them. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of firsts that go along with this, right? The first uh, individuals who have um, benefits from Wall Street and the stock market, uh, the first time that it becomes an interstate operation, connecting states and the union, uh, a management bureaucracy, and of course the first time that people can buy um, stocks and invest in the company and make money off of it. So it's, it's an entirely new animal from anything that's been seen before. And it becomes the largest employer in the United States, more so even than the federal government during this period. So you could see just how much uh, of a potential threat this could pose to the U.S. government and why the government would want to do business with this, right? In order to avoid competition, right, we want to be good buddies here. And so this is really the, the biggest um, impetus to move America from an agricultural economy into this urban industrial economy. Okay? Even though you know, certain parts of the country, the South or the Midwest, are still producing um, agricultural products of some kind, grain, livestock, etc., uh, there is uh, more of a need to industrialize to get this in from this, uh, these products from point A to point B. Okay? And especially once we get into uh, preserving food and meat packing and all that kind of stuff, uh, certain areas where fresh food is concerned become kind of outmoded or outpaced in some cases. So it leads to the, the, the production and sale of processed foods for the first time. And of course the other downside to this too is even though it does facilitate westward expansion, which seems good for the economy, for, for, the, for the country as a whole, it also um, ends up targeting particularly Native Americans, causes them to be suppressed, causes them to lose land and lose lives in the process. And also it has a massive effect on nature too, right? Industry begins to break down nature and the country that we live in right now is vastly different from the one um, that existed when Europeans first arrived in terms of the ecology, in terms of animal and plant life and so forth. Uh, there's an entire history of ecology that exists concerning the United States and how it's, how it's changed so much. By 1865, there's about 35,000 miles of track that have been laid. Okay, and remember, the, the railroad began um, probably sometime in the 1830s in the United States. I think it was the 1820s that it began in Great Britain and eventually came over here. 1897, we see 200,000 miles of track. Okay, so this is, again, blowing very vastly out of proportion. And there are plenty of downsides, uh, aside from what I've already mentioned. Okay? The working conditions uh, for, for working for the railroad are massively um, <laughs> uh, devastating when it comes to uh, everything from limbs being lost, uh, explosions from, from blasting, and so forth. Some railroads are completely unneeded. They don't go anywhere. Sometimes corruption is brought in uh, where people pay for railroads, make promises uh, to politicians and so forth, and then railroads are never built or are built into a dead end. Um, and again, that goes along with having um, poor and sometimes even criminal versions of management, right? People who are just out to make money at the expense of everyone else. And the politicians themselves begin to, again, climb into bed with big business. Okay, so politicians looking to get reelected uh, can make a deal with a railroad company to promise the public that we're going to connect Chicago to Cleveland or whatever the case may be. 
And um, if the railroad never gets built, then it never gets built. But it provides, uh, you know, enough reason for people to come out and vote. The Transcontinental Railroad again is is the most famous um, situation where a railroad is constructed, and it's uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. This is the first time that any country anywhere in the world has a railroad that spans the entire nation. Okay? A transcontinental railroad is one that spans the entire continent. Um, and of course, the construction of the railroad is extremely expensive. Uh, logistically, it's very, very difficult to mobilize that many people, to have them all working together. Um, and not just uh, people from one particular cultural or ethnic group, right? These, these are immigrants in many instances who uh, many times don't even speak the same language, uh, all uh, ostensibly working together toward a, to a common goal. Um, if you've ever heard the term hell on wheels, this is a, a term that refers to the different little uh, mobile camps that construction crews for the railroad would occupy. Um, I believe it's AMC has the uh, a TV series called Hell on Wheels that deals with this particular um, scenario. Um, 1862, before the Civil War ever ends, we have the Pacific Railway Act that's passed. Um, and this is uh, passed as uh, kind of an anticipatory move, really, by the Union, basically saying, we know we are going to win this against the Confederacy, so we are going to make preparations for the success of the nation after the war ends. Okay? And it's to their credit that they did this, because what this does is it guarantees that the railroads are not going to move into the South in any real effective way, at least not at first. Okay? It's going to grant the North a much bigger advantage in terms of uh, production, industrialization, and mobilization of goods uh, to, to boost the Northern economy and essentially leave the South in the dust. Um, and so the North uh, begins to put out this um, this railway path that goes through a north-central route, okay, it doesn't go down into any of the states, initially anyway, it doesn't go into the, any of the states that occupied the former Confederacy. Um, so everything uh, from uh, Oklahoma and Kansas and all that into Nebraska and so forth, all throughout the Midwest is where this initial um, uh, set of track ends up going. And so we have two different branches that begin at different ends of the country, begin construction, pointed toward one another, and they end up meeting in the middle. Okay. The Union Pacific Railroad is the one that begins in Omaha, Nebraska, okay. and this runs across the prairie, across the Midwest, heading toward California. And then the other one comes from the West Coast, from it's called the Central Pacific Railroad. This begins in Sacramento in California, goes through the Sierra Nevada Mountains, which are already very, very treacherous to begin with. Okay, uh, This is where the Donner Party lost their lives. Uh, and it carries on through the Sierra Nevada Mountains and meets the Union Pacific Railroad somewhere in the middle. Okay, So we actually have two different uh, construction crews working at once to meet, to create a, a, a gigantic product. Collis Huntington is uh, the um, the kind of the the guy in charge uh, of the Central Pacific Railroad. Although he is actually very uh, skeptical about whether or not this is going to work, he believes that the mountains are going to be the biggest obstacle, uh, and they do cause a lot of trouble. I mean, uh, the the climate, if nothing else, um, animal attacks, Native American attacks, uh, all kinds of hazards with avalanches and so forth. So there's all kinds of inherent troubles with this. And the other individual is the co-owner of the Central Pacific Railroad, a guy named Mark Hopkins here. Um, and his entire purpose in all this is essentially to build not a safe railroad or a reliable one, but a cheap one. Okay? And this is unfortunately one of the, the key characteristics of, uh, of individuals with this robber baron mentality is build something uh, as cheaply as you can, make it as impressive as you can because there's no other precedent for it but cut corners when and where possible. And the, um, the Pacific Railroad, or the Transcontinental Railroad is finally completed around 1865, right? It works all throughout the Civil War. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of risks involved, much of which we've already covered here, okay? Um, one of the biggest issues, as I said before, is the use of gunpowder and dynamite for the first time. To, uh, to blast holes through mountainsides, to create paths, and so forth. 
And one individual who gains a lot of public notoriety, especially after this happens, um, and has become a, a massively famous individual, even among psychologists, uh, behavioral studies, and so forth, is a, a railroad worker named Phineas Gage. And you see him here in, in the picture. Gage is a, a railroad worker who is responsible for using uh, a tamping iron. It's the, the big broomstick looking item that you see him holding. It's got a spike on one end and, and it's, it's a very long rod. It's about three or four feet long. And the way this would typically work is anytime uh, someone was coming through a demolition crew, a blasting crew was coming through to blast a hole in a mountain or something to create a path, they would manage to uh, drill a hole or tamp a hole down into the rock and then they would fill this little hole uh, which might have been only a couple of inches in diameter but would go down several feet they would fill it with gunpowder okay? and Phineas Gage's job would be to use this tamping rod that he has with that spike on the end to pack the powder down into the hole with this problem is, is this tamping rod that he's using is made of steel Okay. And when steel or iron or whatever metal that you have ends up um, scraping up against certain kinds of rock like flint, for example, it creates a spark. Okay. And what happens here is as he is tamping the rod down into the ground, into the rock, a spark happens, a blast occurs, and the tamping rod is uh, launched like a missile up through his skull. Okay. And miraculously, he survives this. Um, the, I mean, the diagram that you see here seems to indicate that there is po no possible way that this could happen. Um, the, the image of him uh, fully clothed and everything here, you see that he has lost the use of an eye as a direct result. But, uh, the, I mean, this, this is like having a broom handle shoved up through your head and out the top. Um, and what happened here is, it, as you can see here from the diagram, it enter, en, entered under the, the left zygomatic bone, the, the cheekbone, went up through the orbital socket of the left eye, right, he loses his eye, and of course comes out the top of his head. You see the, the large crack that occurs in his skull, skull fracture. Because he manages to survive this, because they managed to doctor him up and everything, he suffers uh, brain damage that uh, leaves him with a completely altered personality for the remainder of his life. It damages the frontal lobe of his brain, which is the central part of the brain that um, deals with um, behavior, that deals with um, compulsions of different kinds. So if you receive uh, frontal lobe damage to your brain, it can alter your personality, it can alter your ability to um, uh, be inhibited by certain things. Um, different versions of Gage's case uh, come about here, but some instances say that even though he was a good, hardworking family man type of individual before, he turned to drinking and prostitutes and being a horrible individual thereafter. Most of that's been blown out of proportion, but there were significant changes in his, um, in his personality in terms of what he did before versus what he did after. So as you can see, the medical community was absolutely dumbfounded by this and, and ended up studying him further. Um, and I can't remember, I believe his skull might be in the possession of the Smithsonian Institute these days, uh, or, or perhaps a, a, a hospital like Johns Hopkins or something like that. But it's he's been studied time and time and time again when it comes to, to psychology and so forth. Fascinating subject. When it comes to constructing the railroad itself, um, different crews with different uh, cultural and social makeup uh, occur with each one of these specific crews. Okay? With the Union Pacific, uh, the, the group that begins in Omaha, Nebraska and goes westward, it's largely um, unmarried Civil War veterans who make up this group. Okay? So if you ever watch the AMC TV series Hell on Wheels, that's essentially who you're, you're dealing with. I believe the main character is a former Confederate soldier. Okay? Uh, in many instances, you have ex-slaves who have been emancipated and who are now in a system that is not that much different from slavery working on the railroad. It's all manual labor with very little, if any, pay. And of course, the first wave of European immigrants that we get in the Americas primarily come from Northern Europe. Okay, so there are a lot of Irish immigrants who have come to the United States following the potato famine in the 1840s, and some German immigrants who come to the United States um, for various reasons, uh, some to escape political turmoil and so forth. 
Central Pacific crews are vastly different though, right? Because they begin on the West Coast, it's a large, large contingency of young Chinese workers who come to the United States. Um, of course, the West Coast is the direct port to the Pacific, right? So there is a, even today, there is still a large Asian population on the West Coast. Um, and this is in the aftermath of uh, the California gold rush as well. So there has already been a, California has a reputation by this point for having gold, for having jobs, for being a place of opportunity and so forth. And so um, these young Chinese men would come to the United States, potentially work uh, for what they believe to be a temporary situation, gain a small amount of savings, and then return to China with this money, and the exchange rate was high enough to where they would actually be able to live almost as wealthy men for the remainder of their lives. Unfortunately, with the working conditions, the amount of um, social, racial, ethnic prejudice that was going on, many of them were trapped in, in a really horrible working condition. Okay? Um, the term coolie is one that you uh, see used during this time period uh, specifically to describe Chinese workers uh, and it's someone who is, um, it's of course a derogatory term now, it's something that could potentially be considered a racial slur, so I, I don't mean to offend just by using it here, but just to explain. Um, it's used as a term specifically for an indentured laborer who comes from East or Southeast Asia. So this is a, becomes a, an, an umbrella term essentially for anyone coming from China, Japan, Laos, Cambodia, etc., for the Philippines or whatever. Uh, and of course, gradually over time, it becomes uh, a racial slur. Um, but um, the the idea of them being indentured laborers basically means they have uh, they secured their passage to the United States by promising to work for an X number of years in a specific industry. That's how they get here. Um, and again, sometimes they are uh, attempting to uh, immigrate temporarily and then return home, but because of unscrupulous business dealings, they don't always they don't always make it. And of course, this is the beginning of a lot of um, anti-Chinese sentiment in the United States. A lot of very horrible caricatures, like what you see here, uh, are are used. Uh, and um, they suffer much of the, uh, the brunt of anti-immigrant sentiment during this time period because their culture, their, uh, I mean, their appearance, everything about them is vastly different from immigrants who've come from Northern Europe and who can uh, pass as quote-unquote white compared to individuals who are coming from Asia who have a vastly different culture, religious beliefs, and so forth from Westerners. And that becomes an entire talking point during this time period. Um, there's a, a, a book that was written uh, by an author, uh, let me see if I've got it here, by an author named um, David uh, Rodinger uh, called Working Toward Whiteness, where um, he basically discusses the idea of any immigrant that comes from any part of the world who can pass as quote unquote white and can assimilate or fit in has a better experience than someone who comes from um, somewhere perhaps in the Far East or from a Central European country or a Mediterranean country where people look a little bit differently than uh, Northern Europeans do or have different belief systems. Entire system of study there that uh, is encompassed in certain uh, even graduate level courses, one of which I managed to take. Um, but anyway, this is an entire system that has, uh, again, more origins here um, than, than anywhere else. And the construction process itself is a long and arduous one as well. Um, begins with surveyors who will look at the, top, the topography, look at maps, and decide where this route is going to go, what's going to be the easiest way to make it go. Engineers come in to design uh, anything to support the tracks. So if you need to build bridges to get across bodies of water, um, if you need to build trestles to get over ravines, uh, tunnels to get through mountains, snow sheds, which are these um, covered structures up in the mountains to prevent avalanches from destroying trains. Tree cutters and graders will come in and level everything to the ground. Uh, again, this is where most of the destruction to the ecology ends up occurring. Um, and they'll come in, they'll prepare the rail beds, they'll put down wooden cross ties with uh, these large 30-foot uh, sections of iron rails which weigh nearly 600 pounds a piece. Um, and then, of course, the spikers will come in, they'll drive the spikes into the ground. This is where the, um, 
the tall tale of John Henry comes in, uh, if you've ever heard of this. This is a very famous uh, piece of uh, early Americana. John Henry was a, allegedly, uh, I, I forget if he was considered a former ex-slave, he was an African-American man who was so powerful that he could use uh, a sledgehammer to, do, to drive spikes into the ground with a single blow. Um, and the, the whole tall tale involves him uh, being in competition with an actual uh, piece of machinery. Okay, and that he actually ends up losing to the machine because it's more powerful than he is. So kind of a, a social commentary on the industrialization of the time. Um, after that, workers would come in, shovel gravel in between the ties, stabilize it. So if you ever see um, you know, a railroad track anywhere in the United States, it still looks very similar to what's being described here with the rail beds, the gravel all around it, and so forth. And of course, this is a, a very dangerous process, right? You have poor weather conditions up in the mountains, tornadoes in, in spring in the Midwest and so forth. Uh, supplies don't always show up on time, so people are just kind of left sitting out in, in the open doing nothing. Um, accidents, of course, like what happens with Phineas Gage. Um, disease epidemics occur, right? People will bring in cholera, there's malaria in some cases, dysentery. And of course, in many instances, um, the, these construction crews end up trespassing into Indian territory and might be attacked, or they might themselves attack Indians and draw a lot more ire. Okay? Um, and of course, these little uh, hell on wheels construction camps are, are notoriously uh, cesspools for crime. Uh, there's gambling, prostitution, alcoholism, murder happens more often than not. Now concerning corporations themselves, okay, how they're structured, what it is they do, how they operate, and so forth. Um, as we've already determined, corporations have this uh, innate need to be um, influential on society and to be in competition with one another and uh, just with the world in general. That seems to be one of the, uh, the core ingredients of being a corporation, at least during this time period, and of course um, stereotypically, at least, from, uh, from that point all the way to the present. Um, and by this point in time, as we've already determined too, the, the political situation in the United States, the move to having Republicans taking control of the White House, um, especially in the aftermath of Andrew Johnson's presidency, the impeachment, um, and the, the sort of delegitimization, at least at that point of the Democratic Party, we start to see the Republican Party gain such a foothold that it's hard for anybody to really come out against them. Okay? The Democrats at this point in time have such a, a negative reputation as being potential in, instigators of secession and of white supremacy and all this kind of stuff, especially in the aftermath of Reconstruction and all the things that were, uh, were done in the South during that period, that it seems like this is the quote-unquote lesser of two evils. Um, in one respect, corporations do provide uh, a sense of um, you know, having a job, having some sort of job security as long as you are not maimed or killed or something in the process. Right? They do actually create positions for men, for women, uh, for unskilled workers, for immigrants, <clears throat> for uh, individuals who are of any cultural or ethnic background. And they do, uh, they are responsible, that is, for actually bringing people into cities, right, to, for actually uh, causing this little influx of individuals to come there to help uh, build cities up to make them uh, more densely habitable places, for better or for worse, okay? And, of course, the, the entire goal of being, a, you know, a businessman, for being a, a, the head of a corporation during this period is to accumulate nothing but money. That's, that's the entire point of all this. And of course, they are the ones behind facilitating um, you know, mass production of things, whether it's machinery, whether it's an actual commodity of some kind, uh, whether it's you know, being in charge of you know, the bonanza farms and just producing something in, in a mass quantity. And of course, the, the politics uh, of all this, we've already kind of gone through this, um, uh, is directly married with it, right? Just this idea that um, corporations have enough influence in society in general that it, it's a good idea to, to you know, associate yourself with them, especially if you are a political party looking to gain support from the public. 
And the businesses during this time period, and even, of course, all the way up to the present, take a whole lot of different forms, okay? And especially the bigger a business gets, the more um, decentralized it gets, the more uh, structure it has to it, the, the more intricacy there is, okay? Um, of course, there are some businesses that are independently owned, operated, founded perhaps by one person, right? It's, it's a, a rare instance in this particular time just because of how big these things get. Uh, some of them end up being partnerships, okay? You might have something like uh, Sears and Roebuck, for example, right? Those uh, two gentlemen, we'll talk about them in a minute, both come together and create a corporation together as a partnership. Over time, some of these businesses, once they get to be big enough, they become corporations. Okay? And the difference between an, an independently owned and operated business and a corporation, not just the size, although that tends to be the, the thing that most people go to, is that corporations separate ownership of the business uh, from management. Okay, uh, if you if you are the uh, the owner of a corporation, chances are you are not the one doing the management. Okay, you might be the one hiring and firing management, right, and kind of overseeing operations in general, but approving things. But um, a manager is often hired by uh, a corporation uh, to to do the work. Okay, um, in order to become a corporation, you have to incorporate yourself with a state government. Right? You have to register with the state government in order to be recognized as such, right? Uh, in order to set up perhaps a franchise or something like that where you have multiple locations. And of course, the, as we've already said, right, the entire purpose of, uh, of a corporation is to raise money, which in this case is referred to as capital. Okay? And the bigger the company is, right, the more people you want to invest in the company, you sell shares of stock. Okay, and this is where the stock market comes from, right? This idea that you are selling a small piece of the business, a small piece of the corporation to an individual who otherwise has nothing to do with it, right? They don't always, um, you're, you're, you know, the, the person who is buying the stock is giving money to you in exchange for a return on their investment. They'll get a little bit of money later once the business gets up and starts doing better. Okay, it's, a, it's kind of a, a blind promise. And the shareholders themselves are not directly involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the business, right? If they, uh, if they decide they want to sell their stock at any point, they have that option usually. Um, but otherwise, they don't really have any, any say in what the business does. If they don't agree with what's going on, they can get out. But, um, but they can't really influence anything else. Uh, typically, the the way that the corporations go is you will have someone who is potentially an owner, right? Under that, you have a board of directors, and the board of directors is a, a group of individuals who basically figure out who they want as the executives of this. Who do they want to be the upper management, the ones who actually oversee all of the operations, okay? Um, and when it comes to the shareholders themselves, this is backtracking a little bit, but shareholders are in a, a fairly win-win uh, situation for the most part because if the business does well, right, if it actually get, does get off the ground and makes a lot of money, they eventually will get uh, a residual check in the mail, right, saying that, you know, your investment is paying off. If for some reason the business goes under, if it violates um, an agreement of some kind, if it gets into legal trouble, if it gets into debt and can't climb out of it, the shareholders are not responsible for any uh, legal uh, obligations, and in some cases they're not even liable for um, for debts or that sort of thing, right? So if the business is in trouble, shareholders can just kind of wash their hands of it. And of course, in a capitalist society in general, Right? The, the whole key component of this is making money and trying to be in direct competition with someone else who is trying to do the same thing you are. Okay? And, of course, this is the big um, argument against capitalism is that this is, you know, competition can be um, not always healthy, right? that it can actually end up causing more harm than good. Okay? And that becomes a, a key argument against capitalism, especially in the latter part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, when other forms of government come about. Okay? The U.S. at this point is really the only major um, country on earth that is a capitalist country. Um, and, of course, so not everybody is in agreement about this, right? Not all businessmen think that competition is a good thing, right? J.P. Morgan, for example, is one individual who thinks that it's more destructive than anything else, okay? 
So um, the uh, the other word in addition to businessman is the word entrepreneur. It just means the same thing. Um, and when it comes to competition, there are companies who will uh, try to do the same thing, right? And to eliminate some competition, um, they will sometimes enter into kind of a gentleman's agreement with one another. They'll create some kind of a product pool saying that, um, you know, we agree that all the production costs are going to be the same, that all of the expenses are going to be the same, but we can use different methods to try to arrive at the same thing. Okay, so if... Uh, if we decide that one of us is going to make the, the exact same product as the other person, but we're going to try to do it cheaper and we're going to try to sell it for a better price and get more business that way, then we're going to do it. But everything else, we're going to try to agree to, to be friendly. And in some cases, when a business gets really, really large, if they have the ability to do so, sometimes they can buy out the competition. Right? They can actually uh, afford enough money to approach the other person who is not making enough money to keep their business afloat and say, we want to buy your factories or we want to buy the rights to your business, absorb it into our own, that sort of thing. And this happens quite a bit when it comes to the robber barons. And, of course, there's all kinds of unscrupulousness that's going on here. Okay, there's uh, laws broken on a regular basis. Um, a lot of this stuff, uh, when, when it comes to certain regulations, a lot of it is unenforceable at this point in time. There's not really any laws in place saying that a person uh, has to provide you know, uh, safe working conditions, that they have to provide fire escapes in case a factory burns down or anything like that. Okay, there's all kinds of hazards going on here. Um, and some are, you know, they make no bones about how they feel about this sort of thing. Um, William Henry Vanderbilt, uh, responsible for cornering the market on railroads and shipping, openly said when he was asked about uh, what the public thought of his methods, he said, the public be damned. He says, I don't care. Um, so, you know, not, these individuals are not always out for the public good, right? They're out for themselves, okay? So to get into some of the actual robber barons themselves, the individuals identified, the so-called robber barons, that is, um, first fellow we'll talk about is John D. Rockefeller. Okay? And the name Rockefeller, of course, is automatically associated with wealth in modern society. Right? You've heard of Rockefeller Center, uh, New, York City, New York City, and all this kind of stuff. Um, Rockefeller made his fortune in oil. Okay? And his fortune um, in, you know, grandiose terms anyway, translated to modern funds, and this is, I think, uh, 2018 or 2019 money. It's worth about $418 billion. I mean, this is a staggering amount of money uh, in today's terms, and of course, back then as well. And Rockefeller's entire principle for approaching business is trying to organize, uh, uh, become more efficient, uh, and, and be very, very tidy with what he does, right? He likes to have all of his ducks in a row, and he likes to try to find new ways of, um, of consolidating things, right? Of, uh, and potentially cutting corners in some regards, um, but to try to make things as efficient as possible. Um, and I have stoicism on there, and stoicism in every picture that you see of Rockefeller, he looks extremely serious, like the, the piercing gaze you see here in the background. Um, he's known for hardly ever laughing in his lifetime, right? He, he takes things very, very seriously. Um, whether that, you know, betrays a, a sense of obsessive compulsive disorder, it's a, it's a possibility when it comes to Rockefeller because of the need for organization and so forth, but again, conjecture. In 1859, the first major oil well is established in the United States in Titusville, Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, and this is the point in time where um, oil it becomes a, a big um, component of society before electricity ever comes about, before the light bulb replaces the gas lamp and so forth. So oil is initially used for just about everything that has to do with light or heat or both. Okay, so anything that has to do with cooking, uh, you know, a, a gas oven, a kerosene lamp, etc. And so uh, refining oil into kerosene is something that can be used by everybody. Okay? And Rockefeller, of course, sees this immediately. Okay? 
1870, he ends up partnering with his brother William. Uh, I don't actually have a picture of William. I don't know if one exists. Um, and uh, let's see here, and two other partners, Henry Flagler, who I believe is the, the gentleman with the brown mustache here, and Samuel Andrews, the, the white-haired man here, uh, to found the company known as Standard Oil. Okay? And Standard Oil is the primary uh, oil-producing company in the United States for Rockefeller's existence. Okay? It is the name in all of this. Okay? It's kind of like the, the apple of its day. Um, and Rockefeller employs something that is uh, really quite groundbreaking when it comes to all of the different uh, aspects of running a business, and that he does something called horizontal integration. Okay? Uh, horizontal integration is where you basically make sure that you make enough money to buy out or force out all competition. Okay? So in other words, if you have someone else who's doing the exact same thing as you do, if they're uh, you know, if they're producing the same product, if they're providing the same service, you do everything you possibly can to make it better, right? This is where the efficiency thing comes in. You charge people a little bit less for it, and then when you make up all the money, you go out and you either force them out of business or you purchase the rights to their, um, to their business. And sometimes what Rockefeller would even go so far as to do is he would take these people, he would recognize their talent, he would recognize their abilities, and he would actually hire them on as executives for his own company. Okay? He would absorb all of the good things while pushing out all the bad things. Okay? And by 1879, this is so successful that Standard Oil very nearly has a monopoly on business uh, when it comes to oil. Okay? Standard Oil controls 90% or more of America's oil refining business. Okay? This is something that today is absolutely unheard of. Right? There are laws in place today preventing this from happening so that we can continue to have an open market. Um, and the idea of a monopoly, of course, you know this from the board game, um, monopoly is where you have a total domination over an industry by a single company. Okay? A, a modern uh, version of a company that does this, that is, um, has been, uh, there, there's laws in place to prevent it from being like this, is the Disney company, the Disney Corporation. Okay? Um, Disney, every time it actually goes and tries to buy out uh, any kind of other company, uh, the the 20th Century Fox merger recently, for example. Um, it has to go through a series of investigations to make sure it's not breaking any laws by doing that because it's absorbing these massive production companies under one roof. Okay, And so, again, if one uh, company controls all the other companies in the country, then we don't really have a, a capitalist society anymore. And so Standard Oil, in addition to having horizontal integration, also employs what's called vertical integration. And this is what is so innovative uh, about doing something like this, in that rather than shopping out its means of production to other businesses and other corporations, it actually owns and operates the entire means of production in-house. Okay? So all of the oil wells, all of the refinery all the refineries, all the, the oil pipelines, any storage tanks, any ships to transport any of it, it owns all of it. Okay? Rockefeller has enough money to own all of this. Okay? So being able to vertically integrate all of these um, systems of operation into one corporation makes it cheaper because you don't have to pay someone else to do it for you. Okay? Again, it's an investment. You have to turn around and make sure that it's going to work for you, but uh, Rockefeller was able to pull it off. In 1882, Rockefeller goes so far as to establish uh, the Standard Oil Trust in order to kind of bypass this little system of trying to identify monopolies. Okay? Um, he basically creates a shell company to divert um, people's attention from, the, from the, the reality that he actually owns all this means of production. Right? Um, he's, he's doing his best to make sure that he retains his power, that he retains his money without, um, uh, without seeming like he's breaking the law. And the other thing that this allows him to do is it allows this trust fund company, uh, this trust company, to actually purchase stock in the uh, in the companies of his competition. So he's kind of in a win-win situation here, where if he if his business does well, then he makes money. If someone else's business does well, he has stock purchases in that company, and he gets a residual check from them as well. So he gets money either way, no matter what happens. Okay, and it also gives him. Uh, enough money or enough power as a stockholder where in some instances, this is the case, not always, 
But in some instances, stockholders can influence how a company does business. Okay, and so this gives him a, kind of a you know this little uh, undermining uh, tunnel into someone else's business. Um, and uh, it's estimated that during this period, um, he he has stockholders who transfer shares from more than 30 different companies to Rockefeller and eight other people. So he's actually working the strings on about 30 companies at the same time that he is working a, a, a legal monopoly <laughs> in Standard Oil. So this is how he makes so much money. Okay? Um, and of course, the stockholders are are making a lot of money off of this, right? So they um, they you know the trust fund the trust actually earns money, transfers uh, money to the stockholders, the shareholders, and everything is copacetic. Um, in 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act is one particular law that uh, attempts to look at what individuals like Rockefeller are doing and saying that this is. Uh, pushing the limits of what is legal in, in a capitalist society and uh, tries its best to suppress any of these types of actions but it doesn't really work because by this point republican based politics and big business are so enamored with one another that one is not willing to hold the other accountable and so Rockefeller goes so far as to create a holding company, <laughs> which is essentially what, what he's doing here is he's creating different little uh, forks or branches off of his primary company. Okay, So Standard Oil has uh, the first branch off of it, which is an oil trust, and then another branch off of the oil trust is, um, uh, is a holding company. And the holding company doesn't produce anything, Okay, but what it does do is it ends up controlling other companies by holding stocks. Okay, so he is creating pockets within pockets within his business to make sure that he is uh, uh, making more and more money doing it this way, right? Uh, in modern terms, we refer to this as passive income, right? A way that you can um, create or manufacture something that is almost self-sustaining um, and, and you get uh, regular dividends off of it. So that's essentially what he's doing. He's, he has passive income coming in for this. Um, and this is called the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey. Again, it's, it doesn't do anything except hold stock for other people. Another uh, of the robber barons that we see during this period, and one who is seemingly a little bit more scrupulous than Rockefeller was, is Andrew Carnegie. Okay? Uh, Carnegie, of course, you've heard of Carnegie Hall, again, in New York City. Uh, Andrew Carnegie makes his entire um, his entire fortune in the steel industry. Okay? His fortune is estimated to be worth about three hundred and seventy two billion dollars uh, in today's terms. Uh, Carnegie is a little bit different because he himself is actually uh, an immigrant from Northern Europe. He comes from Scotland. Okay, um, he migrates to Western Pennsylvania in eighteen forty eight, and of course Pennsylvania and primarily Pittsburgh becomes the central hub for steel production in the United States. Uh, Carnegie is also a very little man too. He's only about five feet tall, uh, and so people kind of, uh, you know, they depict him in many ways uh, in this particular political cartoon in the background. He's depicted in uh, wearing a little kilt, distributing gold, almost like a uh, like a little leprechaun of some kind. Right? People kind of tended to make fun of his height. Um, Around the same time that Carnegie actually migrates to the U.S., um, there is a, uh, a British uh, inventor named Sir Henry Bessemer who invents what's called the Bessemer converter. And what this does is it is a, a new way of refining uh, steel from iron. Okay, so the the way it works is iron is actually uh, taken from an ore. Okay, ore being like a, a chunk of a mineral that is you know heated up and conditioned in such a way where it hardens. Okay. Uh, steel requires that iron ore to be combined with other uh, materials to be made into something that's harder and lighter than iron. Okay, so that's why we end up having steel replacing iron in many cases. And the Bessemer converter is a machine, or a system at least, to do this, to uh, produce steel in a quicker capacity at a higher quality so it doesn't break, that it doesn't buckle. And before Bessemer came around, steel was um, made from uh, wrought iron that was taken from uh, Sweden. It was very, very expensive to make. It was a lot of money to you know, ship it from overseas. But uh, what Carnegie does is he actually takes 
Bessemer's method and he employs it when it comes to the steel industry and he actually gets in business with the railroad industry. Okay, and right now at this point in time, the railroad industry is the industry in the United States. Again, it's the biggest um, employer. Okay, so he, he gets in uh, the door with all the right people is, is the point. By 1860, the United States is producing about 13,000 tons of steel okay, on an annual basis. 20 years later, it's 1.4 million tons annually. Okay, So Carnegie's um, use of the Bessemer method is, is exponentially uh, making him money. Okay? This is where all of his, um, you know, all of his, uh, his wealth comes from. Okay. By 1900, Carnegie Steel is the company, is the largest industrial company anywhere in the world for anything. Okay. Anything that you can imagine, uh, Carnegie Steel is out, outflanks all of them. Um, and it's estimated that at this point in time, and this is part of what allows the United States to um, gain such impressive uh, armaments and uh, uh, you know, armored ships, uh, battleships, and so forth like that, right before the First World War, uh, is that um, Carnegie Steel is such a large steel production company that it outproduces Great Britain and Germany combined during this period. Okay, uh, And Great Britain, at this point in time, is already starting to manufacture steel-clad warships. Okay, And Germany has uh, only been an industrialized country um, by the time 1900 comes around, it's only been that way for about 40 or 50 years. Okay, so it really has uh, is kind of having to ramp up its production very quickly. But Carnegie is really the one who is allowing this to happen in the United States. And just like Rockefeller, Carnegie is focused on efficiency. He does the same thing that Carnegie or that um, Rockefeller does, and that he actually employs this vertical integration uh, as well as horizontal. Right, so he buys out all of his competition. He brings all of the methods of production in-house, um, and he owns every means of production you can think of. He owns all the mines, where the ore is, uh, is mined from, all of the ships that uh, send it from point A to point B, all of the rails, right? Uh, so he's, and, and his workers are on a system to where he has a rotating shift to where his factories never stop, okay? Um, he has a, a worker who works a 12-hour shift, and then immediately someone comes in for that shift, picks it up, and works all the way until the next shift. Okay, Day and night, his factories are going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And again, this is part of what allows him to be so um, uh, proficient in terms of the amount of money that he makes. John Pierpont Morgan, also known as J.P. Morgan, of course, is what we associate with banking. Okay, you've heard of J.P. Morgan Chase. That's uh, a combination of J.P. Morgan and Chase Bank. Okay, um, and of course, this is where all of Morgan makes his money. Okay, is in the banking industry. Um, compared to Rockefeller and Carnegie, it seems like uh, Morgan makes quite a bit less. He makes twenty-five point two billion. Again, in you know, in our terms, this is still a ton of money. And Morgan actually has a different background. He's not really a self-made individual in that he's actually born directly into a wealthy family who lives in Connecticut. Um, he actually attends schools overseas in Switzerland and Germany. So he's a very, um, uh, very well-off individual from the get-go. Okay? Um, and incidentally, a lot of people point out in caricatures and so forth, like you see in the background, um, how large his nose is. And uh, the reason for that is he actually suffered from a skin condition that left his nose uh, in a constantly swollen state, almost to a almost to a comic extent. And it doesn't look uh, too out of proportion here. But as he got along further in life, his nose seemed to kind of grow a little bit more bulbous, and he was very um, self-conscious about this. By 1857, he uh, establishes the J. Pierpont Morgan and Company. Okay, and this is basically an investment company where he is taking um, uh, European money, investing them into American businesses, and then turning around and providing uh, the dividend. Okay, so and part of what he does here is he goes into uh, uh, companies that might be struggling or companies that are trying to merge with other companies. He ends up kind of facilitating that. Okay. He helps purchase large amounts of stock for certain companies. Uh, he sells them for profit. Uh, and if there is a struggling company, right, one that is just not doing very well, they don't want to go out of business, he comes in, takes over, 
reorganizes the company and supervises operations. And occasionally he'll turn around and he'll resell the company and make money off of the sale of that. Okay, so he he moves money around very well. Um, and again, Morgan is one that is very unlike most of the other so-called robber barons in that he absolutely hates uh, competition of all kinds. Okay? Carnegie and Rockefeller thrive on competition because they believe that other people are out to corner their market, and J.P. Morgan knows that money's not necessarily going anywhere. Okay? Uh, he says that if we have more stability rather than um, you know, manipulating people, manipulating trusts, if we have mutual consolidation, then it's more stability and there's a greater chance that this will last longer. Okay, so that's to his credit. By the 1890s, J.P. Morgan controls about one-sixth of all of America's railroads because of all the investment that he's done in it. Okay? Um, and he becomes so proficient at one point that in 1901, he buys out Carnegie Steel. Okay, buys out all their steel and iron holdings uh, after he merges several companies together. So he knows how to work behind the scenes to get all this um, to, to work to his advantage. And out of all that, out of the steel and iron holdings, he creates the United States Steel Corporation. And this is the first corporation in America that reaches the billion dollar mark. Okay, it has over 168,000 employees at its height. Okay, so he's, he's able to be uh, not only proficient in moving money around, but also in establishing um, new precedents. And when it comes to consumer products, okay, um, as I said before, at the end of the Civil War, America starts to uh, manufacture consumer products in addition to um, all, of the, uh, all of the implements that it's used during the war. So it's not just producing steel or railroad ties or, um, or you know, anything like that. It's also producing things that are consumables, right? It's things that people want for their house, that people want you know, uh, to give as gifts to one another, whatever you can think of. Okay? The fellow who begins this little revolution is a traveling salesman named Aaron Montgomery Ward. Okay, if you've heard of the Montgomery Ward catalog, right, he is uh, the fellow who kind of begins the idea of a mail order catalog and eventually one that kind of um, develops into the department store ideology. Okay? He believes that uh, you can reach a much wider range of consumers uh, through mail order catalogs. Right? If you send a mail order catalog to everybody in the United States, if everybody purchases something, right, then the money comes back exponentially. Uh, in the 1870s, he establishes Montgomery Ward and Company, and what this does is he decides he's going to take a little bit of a hit here because he starts selling goods at a 40% discount okay, through mail order catalogs. Um, you know, you, you pay for, you don't have to pay for the convenience, in other words, if you can't find something at a local store, if you order it through the catalog, right, you get it for cheaper, you might have to wait a little bit longer though. Not too long thereafter, Richard Warren Sears and Alva Curtis Roebuck of Sears and Roebuck, right, established Sears, Roebuck and Company. Okay, and these guys do the exact same type of thing that Montgomery Ward is doing. Of course, Richard Warren Sears is who the Sears Corporation is named for. Sears just went out of business not too long ago. Um, and this is something that uh, does a very similar thing to what Montgomery Ward is doing, except they do it in a department store setting. Okay? They take goods that are purchased at a higher volume from wholesalers, right? kind of like Costco does, but then they turn around and sell them at a lower cost. Right? So you're, you're buying mass quantities of things and then you're selling them for cheaper prices. And so, by 1897, with all that you can potentially purchase from them, the Sears and Roebuck catalog is 786 pages long, okay? And it's filled with just about everything you can possibly imagine, right? Everything from uh, carriage pieces to clothing to household items. Um, there even is, I think all the way up until the end of World War II, there is a section uh, for purchasing houses through there. You can actually purchase the, the floor plan uh, the blueprint for uh, for one of I think it's four or five different models of a house. You purchase that, and then you purchase uh, the building materials. They send you the entire thing as a kit, and then you hire somebody to build the house for you. Okay, so it's it's kind of a uh, a neat little thing again that's never been done before at this point in time. Um, by 1898, they established that they are going to uh, extend free mail delivery to rural areas. So you get a wider audience this way, right? People who are not living anywhere near cities, now they can enjoy all the things that people living in cities enjoy. 
And by 1900, six million catalogs are produced on an annual basis. And it's estimated that at this point in time, it's the second most read book after the Bible in the year 1900. Um, that statistic is only replaced uh, 50 years later by the Lord of the Rings. And by 1907, it's one of the largest businesses that we have here in America. The era of transformation that comes with all these types of things is, uh, of course, absolutely staggering, right? Uh, even though there are harsh working conditions uh, that are implemented by all these different uh, so-called robber barons and so forth, they feel like they're justified in what they're doing because they feel like you know, it's, it's negligible compared to what they have to give back to society, right? Whether they actually do give or not, in some cases, is up for debate. Many of them, though, do turn to philanthropy later on in life. Okay. Um, several of them refer to what they believe as a, salt, a law of societal evolution. Okay, and this is where the uh, this is the time period when Charles Darwin comes out with the idea of the origin of species and so forth. It eventually gets um, manipulated and uh, turned into uh, uh, social Darwinism, which we'll talk about in a future chapter. But it's basically a, a misunderstanding of what evolution is supposed to supposed to be. Okay, it's the idea. Um, uh, social uh, Darwinism is that way. Anyway, the idea that um, you are basically anybody who is unable to keep up with you in business is being essentially weeded out by society and by the universe. Okay, and you shouldn't feel guilty about that. You should only feel proud of yourself for being the one to inch them out of the way. Okay, um, Andrew Carnegie actually goes so far as to write a, a book that he called The Gospel of Wealth saying that capitalism has been a necessary evil, essentially, that it's brought more good to society than bad. Um, and he, it it's, comes across in some ways as kind of a, um, a hypocritical book because on the one hand, while he is actually denouncing the worship of money, on the other hand, he's actually uh, celebrating how much uh, good he's done and how much money he's made. Okay, so coming from a position of wealth, it's easy to argue that capitalism has brought good to society. If you're a member of the working class, you might not share his, um, his ideas. By 1900, Rockefeller is the world's leading philanthropist, though. Uh, it's estimated that during the later part of his life, he donates more than $500 million to different charities. Uh, and of course, this is why so many parts of the country and so many uh, organizations and so forth are named after him. Okay. The University of Chicago is uh, founded in part by his donations. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, of course, is established in 1913. And Andrew Carnegie does the exact same thing. After he retires, he starts distributing his fortune for several different reasons. Uh, it's estimated that he is responsible for funding about 3,000 libraries in the United States. Uh, in addition to that, churches, hospitals, universities, and even some parks and venue halls like Carnegie Hall.